Imperial Yeast is at it again with their Imperialis project, creating yet another unique proprietary strain through hybridization. In addition to its excellent attenuation and rapid reduction of diacetyl, I-10 Mangostini contributes robust, ripe tropical fruit, strawberry, and lychee notes that complement modern hops. And as a Kvike hybrid, it can be fermented anywhere from 78 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 to 32 degrees Celsius without any negative issues. Head over to imperialyeast.com to learn more about I-10 Mangostini and be sure to pick some up for your next batch of fruity IPA. Welcome to the Brew Lab. One of the coolest things about brewing science is pushing the boundaries of what we think we know about brewing ingredients or processes. Like, for example, malt. We think of it as the primary sugar source for yeast to make beer with some accompanying flavor characteristics like bread, cracker, toast, and maybe some color. But we don't think of it as a source of thiols, at least not until after this episode. I'm your host, Kay Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with my colleague, Cecile Cheneau, who's currently a postdoctoral scholar at Oregon State University, but she got her PhD studying thiols at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium and continued her study of thiols in malt at the University Montpellier in France. Now, I don't want to spoil her fun as she describes how they came up with the idea to study thiols in malt, but as a teaser, malt could be a repository of bound thiols, which of course are those thiols that are super potent, fruity, tropical passion fruit compounds, but they're bound up with an amino acid and thus not aromatic. Now, does malt have a repository of these bound thiols? That's one of the questions that Cecile asks. And then, assuming it does have bound thiols, can we access them? Do they survive the mash or even the boiling process? If malt has bound thiols and we can access them, why don't all malt beers smell like thiol bombs? These are questions I'll ask and answers Cecile will give us. Uh, And of course, we'll talk more about this and malt as a source of thiols as we get into the episode. If you haven't yet signed up to become a patron, please consider doing so. By becoming a patron of Brewlosophy, you get awesome rewards like access to the Brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never published, new discounts each month to yakimavalleyhops.com, and for $3 a month, access to monthly live Q&A sessions with a special guest from the brewing industry. Becoming a patron is easy. Once you've contributed at that $3 level or higher, you get access to the private Patreon Facebook page where all of the previous Q&A sessions are available to watch. So, of course, guests like Vinny Chalurzo, John Palmer, and the brewlosopher himself, Marshall Schott. There are so many more, and all you have to do and all the information that you need to get access to this awesome resource is go to patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Please check it out. Thank you to everyone that's left a rating or review of the show. We're over 100 ratings on Apple Podcasts, which is awesome. And if you haven't yet left a rating or review on your podcast service of choice, I'd really appreciate it. Take a second. Let us know what you think of the show and help others like you find us. Feedback this week is from listener Troy, who says, Hey, Kate, I was listening to episode 169, What We Know About Hop Creep with Dr. Tom Shellhammer, and I was surprised to find out that hop creep might be happening as a result of the presence of microbes on the hops themselves. The only time that I experienced noticeable hop creep was when I was temporarily buying my brewing supplies from an, a local homebrew shop that had horrible storage practices. The yeast, the hops and yeast, which were dry, were all stored at room temperature. I know I should have turned around, but I wanted to support them. I didn't think much of this, but I quickly realized why my beers were turning out poorly. Anyway, I was taken by surprise when I dry hopped and my fermentation took off for an additional two weeks. I'd never experienced this before or since. Microbes might have been responsible since I know that the hops were stored at warmer temperatures, which might have promoted their vitality. Thanks for what you are doing. You guys have done amazing things for brewing. Uh, Troy, thank you uh, for the comment and for the feedback. This is a cool anecdote and that's really an interesting experiment um, that I'd like to a replicate. Take some hops, let them sit at room temperature, and then measure their hop creep potential. I've heard stories about bo- bags of hops that are like blowing up during transportation like, whenever they're handled warm, and that certainly implies that microbial activity is happening, right? That there are microbes present on the hops, because otherwise those bags, which are vacuum sealed, um, they wouldn't expand. The only way they'd expand if gas is being produced and microbes, and, and so some sort of um, uh, you know, fermentation or something like that is happening. Some sort of energy generation that's producing um, CO2. But based on Matt Cottrell's research and others, I'm not sure that those microbes, even if they are present and, you know, potentially fer- uh, fermenting in a bag of uh, of hops, I don't know that they would contribute to hop creep in beer. A hop creep, a hop 
package is a very different environment from that low pH, high CO2, and alcoholic beer. Um, Still, I would be really interested to see. This would be a really fun experiment to say, okay, if there are, if we give these microbes the ability to grow in hops and then pitch those hops directly in beer, would we still see hop creep? And would it change um, based on, uh, you know, the the microbial activity or not? That'd be a pretty cool experiment, and I'd love to see that. And also, Cecile Cheneau, if you're listening, hint, hint, maybe this might help you with some of your upcoming research. Uh, Troy, thank you for the suggestion, um, and thank you for listening. All right, I'll be back after this short break talking about malt as a source of thiols with Dr. Cecile Cheneau. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Macy's has all of your Grillmaster essentials for Father's Day. Stop by to get our hand-trimmed chicken breast and certified Angus beef patties that are ready to grill so Dad can have his favorite dinner. Make sure to browse our bakery to find the perfect no-work Father's Day treat with our decadent peanut butter bars or famous donuts. Right now, you can get boneless beef ribeye steaks for $12.99 per pound at Macy's. Shop these Father's Day essentials in-store or online at Macy's.com through June 18th. Macy's, happy shopping! Understanding thiols is a popular research topic among brewing scientists. It's garnered a lot of attention, especially with respect to hops and releasing bound thiols from hops during fermentation. It's even generated research into genetically engineered yeast. But what about thiols from malt? Well, today in the lab, I'm speaking with Dr. Cecile Cheneau, who did her PhD on thiols from the University Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. Cecile, welcome back to the Brew Lab. Yeah, thank you, Kate. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and you were last on the show a while back, episode 108, where we talked about enzymatic release of bound thiols, uh, specifically from hops. Um, And on that episode, um, you mentioned that perhaps there may be more bound thiols in malt than in hops. Is that true? Oh, no. Actually, it's not true. There there are, in fact, way less bound thiols in malt than in hops. But um, it's a matter of proportion. There is much we use much more malt than hops to brew a beer, of course. So um, the difference of of concentration in bond tiles might be uh, played around with that kind of proportion. Ah, I see. So that's what I was remembering from episode one hundred and eight. It's not necessarily that malt has more, but we use a lot more malt uh, than we do hops uh, in beer. So that's interesting. Well, cool. Well, I'm excited to talk to you then about malt and thiols, getting thiols. From malt, but first, you've had some uh, pretty significant changes. Of course, you know we remember you got your PhD from the University Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, but you are now my colleague as a postdoctoral <laughs> researcher at Oregon State University, working with Dr. Tom Shell- Tom Shellhammer. So it sounds like quite a bit's happened for you since we last spoke. At least last spoke on the podcast, because of course we sit next to each other and spoke 15 minutes ago. But what, <laughs> what have you been up to since the last episode uh, where you were on the podcast? Uh, yes, indeed. I did uh, quite a move. I, I moved to the US and joined the uh, Tom Shalamar's team. And I'm now a postdoc in uh, in his lab working on on hop aging project. So uh, it will involve a little bit of tiles, but uh, also include much more, a much broader picture regarding how on how ups age. 
Um, and yes, I have the pleasure to be your colleague. So yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's great. Yeah. So again, a, a big move um, across the country. Of course, I, I think last time we spoke, you already had your PhD. Uh, but yeah, now you're here uh, with us and studying um, studying hops um, in Dr. Shellhammer's lab. Now, the, the topic that we're going to talk about today, though, is work that you did for your PhD, right? Where you studied malt and thiols. Uh, no, actually, it was after my PhD. It was kind of a, a postdoc. Um, no, not kind. It was uh, included in my postdoc, and I did a mission um, in Montpellier, where I, I was uh, able to study in Aurélie Holland's team, which is also an expert on thiol and thiol precursors, which is more focused on wine, especially. But she had already also studied hops, uh, so that's why uh, she uh, she was part of my. Uh, supervising team during my PhD. And then after the PhD, we decided to do a collaborative work on that. Ah, cool. On thiols and malts. Well, I want to hear much yeah. more about this. Now, I've done several episodes um, on thiols, including, like I said, one from you, um, you know, back in episode 108. But could you remind us, so what are we talking about when we're talking about thiols? What are those thiols that are important and desirable for beer flavor characteristics? So yeah, uh, thiols is a uh, pretty... Uh, like include a lot of different molecules of course we usually focus on polyfunctional thiols and like three or four of them are really important especially in beer we will have the three sulfenyl hexanol and it's it's acetate the three sulfenyl exyl acetate uh, also the four what you we usually call for smp and uh, a branched one three sulfanyl four methyl pentanol those are um, molecules that have a really really low threshold I, I always use this image to to express it but it's basically like a drop of it in an olympic pool would be sufficient for you to smell it so they are like very potent aromas and so they usually play a big role in the organoleptic profile of a beer, even though they are found at trace level. So that's also what makes them difficult to study because they are found at really, really low levels. Yeah, of course, right? Measuring those uh, has got to be a nightmare. Um, and again, I, <laughs> I say this for, from sitting next to you. I know it's, it's somewhat of a nightmare occasionally, but you know, you have a lot of experience doing this. Um, and so uh, so the, you mentioned like the three sulfanol uh, hexanol and the three sulfanol hexanol acetate and then a couple of the others. Before we get too lost in the, in the like uh, technical terms for those three SH and 3SHA, I think is how they're most common known. And then, like you said, 4MMP and f what was the last one? 3, 4... SM 3S, 3S, 4MP. There it is, 3S, 4MP. But those, what flavors are those compounds associated with? Yeah, so 3SH and 3SHA are more like, I mean, 3SH is really grapefruit, uh, Patient fruit also sometimes rhubarb is rhubarb, how yeah. you say it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, while three SH will be yeah even more towards like the patient fruit side, and we say the the acetate version is more round like a uh, more yeah uh, soft aromas, and the four SMP is really well known to have uh, this. Uh, black currant aroma and up to a certain concentration it becomes like a cat pee aroma <laughs> yeah yeah cat pee right but these are all flavors that are really popular in ipas right these tropical fruit flavors passion fruit uh you know guava is another one that we hear from a lot uh yeah. you know and and so yeah at, at these threshold levels they uh play uh, huge roles in beer flavor. So yeah, I can see why um, people are studying them. And of course, like why the folks at Omega Yeast have made thialized yeast strains and Berkeley Yeast is doing things in that regard too. Now, but we're not talking about hops um, in this case. We're not talking about getting uh, those flavors from hops. But thiols, like you said, are, are, are a lot of different compounds, right? But the ones that we care the most about in beer are these handful of, uh, of thiols. So does malted barley have these handful of compounds as well as hops? Uh, so not uh, as a free form. So that's when I, I guess I will introduce the, the notion of free and bond form for thiols. Yeah, that's a good reminder, so, yeah. So yeah, those those when we say free, it means the the are there are these aromatic uh, molecules. But when we talk about bond thiols, it means there are odorless molecules. They are basically uh, linked to another molecule that makes them heavier, and they are 
completely odorless. Uh, but um, so yeah, no free dials in malt. Uh, but then yeah, the, I won't spoil the rest of the conversation. But we'll talk about the more <laughs> we'll talk, talk about whether there are bound the yeah, yeah dials in malt. Yeah, that that's of course is the 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 subject of the research today. Is 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 that? Um, and so that's I wanted to focus on that for just a second. The free versus bound thiols. So hops have a high concentration of free thiols then. Uh, yeah, hops has free thiols, but but has much more uh, of bomb thiols still. Like bomb thiols are usually the major form of the pool of any thiols, with some exceptions. Uh, which is, uh, but but hops do contain already a little bit of free thiols, which is different from grapes. By the way, grapes only have bomb thiols, but doesn't have free thiols. The free will only occur in the wine after fermentation. I see, I see. So so it sounds like there are like at least several different plants there, right? You said you mentioned grapes. We're talking about malt on this episode and hops. Um, and it sounds like, so maybe we should nerd out for just a second then. Like how are bound thiols made in the plant? Uh, this sounds like it's part of a natural process that the plants go through. Yeah, yeah. So th- those type of molecules have been uh, identified in a bunch of other plants too, I should mention, like uh, in patient fruit. Uh, by example, even in bell peppers, we have uh, tiles and uh, and the bond form. And the, the beliefs, uh, I mean, no study have shown that um, it comes from a reaction between a glutathione, which is a three peptide that is known to have a detoxification role in plants, that will react with a molecule that is considered as the toxic, uh, as toxic for plant, which is an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. Sorry for the complicated word, <laughs> but this molecule uh, arises from a lipid oxidation uh, breakdown, and this lipid oxidation breakdown usually occur after stress, any kind of biotic or abiotic stress that the plant could uh, could, uh, could have. So so it's a response to um, a stressor. So the, the plant has abiotic or biotic stress and it has some sort of molecule that's a toxic um, to it and it needs to do something with that toxic mole- molecule. And, and, and so in this case, it would be something I'm guessing like a sulfur molecule that's toxic and then it needs to bind it and get rid of it. Is that right? Or, or am I off? Um, no, actually at this point, the, the molecule doesn't contain any, uh, any sulfur yet. Uh, the glutathione is the one that has the thiol function and the thiol function really reacts with the, the molecule. And, and that's how you create the bond form of, of thiols because once the break uh, will happen from this bond, then the thiol moiety will stick with the aromatic molecule i see i see it becomes it becomes a it becomes aromatic so do do hops and barley then bind thiols the same way i mean is are there yeah it it's hard to say at this point like uh the question had been widely studied in in grapes again because yeah all this the study on on thiols have mostly started on on grapes and wine uh, so most of the stuff we have on hops and malt are based on those uh literature but yeah, we don't know much yet on what could be different f- between those two plants. Between the different plants. Okay, that makes sense. And, um, and one other question too, you mentioned lipid oxidase, and that's something that I remember of scratching my brain back from um, malt. And it's, it's from several years ago when we, when everybody was like, um, you know, focused in on lox free barley, lipid oxidase free barley. Is that related at all to what we're talking about here? Yeah, definitely, because uh, uh, it will require the action of a lux to produce the, the the toxic molecule I was talking about, those aldehyde, alpha, beta, and saturated. So, yeah, it's through the action of lux that those molecules will occur. And indeed, you, you are right, those lux have been widely studied in malt because they were uh, causing the issue of trans 2 non nl the cardboard of flavor in beers. So many, many work have been done on that to yeah understand where this was coming from. Oh, and so I guess, is this kind of where you guys got the thought to look at at, at malt or as for thiol? Um, yeah, 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 because we knew that uh, malt had a lot of flux, so it would have made sense to have at least the, the haldehyde molecule, and then would it react with the glutathione or not? 
yeah, we didn't know at that point, but I guess we were right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we guess you were right. Um, and one other question then about that too, and I'm sorry, we're kind of off on a, or nerding out on a on a tangent over here, but I find it interesting. If you there were talk there was talk about this like making locks free malts. If you make locks free malts, do you limit the malts ability to bind thiol or have bound thiols? I mean, it depends when you're trying to inhibit that lux. The, the whole issue with lux was during the mashing process. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if lux had time to to act in situ in the plants before even being like uh, malted or anything, or during the malting process, um, I guess that could still be yeah all right. But you're right if we if we try to engineer mold that doesn't have any lux activity at some point, it might be an issue to have at least one of the precursors to form the bond form of dials. Okay, okay, all right. I think we've nerded off far enough on that branch yeah. uh, over there. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so then uh, if, if um, you know, we, we see this lux activity and, and we know that plants respond to these, uh, you know, uh, uh, toxins in these ways by using the glutathione, um, does that mean then that we, we could assume that mold uh, that, that thiols were in malt, but that's again, I guess, what you were trying to study in this research is do, do does malt contain bound thiols? Right, that's the ultimate question that you're looking for. I mean, we uh, it, it had already been shown before those studies. Like uh, some people had already looked at malt and they had found some uh, bound thiols. So we 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 were in the, in the complete dark, of course. We already knew, but we wanted to get an idea on. How much, uh, yeah, how much of these pond tires we would find in malt, and also there is so many different malt on the market, uh, the the pilsner and then all these uh, special malts with a higher color, and we were wondering, yeah, basically what what the as like the tire the bond tire content would look like in all these different hubs and would uh, in in malt sorry all these different malts <laughs> and whether the color on would be affecting the bond thiol content or not i see so looking at how different malts might have different levels of bound thiols and how kilning and processing and malting and all that stuff and mashing would would play a role in that we'll get to the study design in just a second but i had i, I think two more questions and they're sort of related um first of all is a question about like how um how thiols are released uh, from their bound form, because I think that's an interesting thing to discuss before we get into, you know, what bound forms are uh, exist. But then the other thing is, is um, what is the ultimate outcome for for beer here, right? If you can show that there are bound thiols from malt, I guess it stands that the theory would be, can we use these as a source for adding thiols to beer, right? Is that sort of the hypothesis also of the study or a question that was seeking to answer? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, first question: so how thiols are released? So there is a like a bunch of different, and I mean they can be released either enzymatically or chemically, uh, like thermally, by example. But um, mostly enzymatic reaction can occur to release the thiol from this bond form. There is different type of bond form. So I mentioned the glutathione. Uh, already, so it's like called the glutathione-related uh, precursors. But then, so this, since it's a tripeptide, you can basically shrink that uh, peptide chain, remove uh, one uh, amino acid or another, and end up with like shorter uh, amino acid chain, like either a dipeptide or only one amino acid linked to that uh, molecule, and. So sorry, it's, I'm trying to make it simple, but no, maybe that, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, you've got three, uh, you've got three peptides that are attached to the glutathione, and so you know if you're going to change it or modify that, there's three places where you can get rid, right? So if there yeah, are exactly. ways to to reduce it, you can remove potentially any of those three amino acids, and you have a different molecule uh, that that's a result. Yeah, yeah. You start uh, since the the amino acid in the middle, the cysteine is the one linked to the to the tile, let's call it that way. Um, you can start removing uh, one side of the chain or the other, so either the glutamate or the glycine, and then eventually you'll end up with the cysteine-related precursors. And at this point, 
most like in yeast, we know that uh, beta lease activity is able to to break the bond between cysteine and the thiol moiety, releasing the thiol. Okay, so that makes sense then. So I think one other thing that I've read in the literature that I've heard talked about is this idea of a G conjugate and a C conjugate. And that's essentially what you're what you were just talking about. A G conjugate is that glutathionylated thiol. So it's that tri, that tripeptide with the cysteine in the middle. And then a C conjugate is basically just the cysteine um, and, and with the the thiol in its in that form. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I see. And so then what the the whole point then of bound thiol, so the plant is going to make these G conjugates or um, and then potentially break down the th- those um, G conjugates as they need it. But the point is to get to that cysteine thiol bond and then yeast through something like beta lyase would liberate that thiol causing the aromatic flavors that we want in beer. Yeah. That's right. Ah, cool. Okay, that that starts to make a lot of sense uh, yeah. to me um, about about how um, thiols are thiols are are released. Okay, so then what we need to know then is how much, like you said, of those bound, let's say, G conjugate and C conjugate exist in the malt. Yeah, that was the initial question in it. Yeah. And so let's take us through then the study design of what you did. Well, it's actually, I, I say take us through the study design. It was actually two studies um, that we're going to discuss together today because I think it paints a nice round picture um, of what you did looking at malt um, and uh, bound thiol concentration. So why don't you talk to us, maybe talk to us first about what the ultimate goal of the two research studies was at, were and then um, how you went about answering that question. Yeah, so as I already mentioned, uh, the first study was really about getting a sense on how what would be the level of bond tiles in different malls according to maybe color or yeah type of, of kindling process, etc. Uh, and really have yeah, a broader picture because we already knew that bond tiles could be found in mold, but those studies were uh, looked at only a really short uh, data set. And then um, knowing that we have different form of bond tiles. We possibly have also the enzymes that are able to break down and uh, and are useful in the interconversion of the different bond form. So we put the malt in in a more like mashing situation. So we did like lab scale mashing trials where we apply different temperature that would be like uh, like first room temperature, but also uh, 45, 55, and 80 degrees Celsius, uh, which are sometimes um, used in a, in a classical mashing steps, let's say. And see uh, any of this temperature, uh, if the malt had the enzymes to uh, modify the content of bond form and create uh, interconversion between these bond forms. I see. Yeah, yeah. And and so again, like to to add a little bit more detail to that, um you guys were looking at in that first study looking at 30 different um types of pale malt and then 12 different um types of specialty malt. So that was a pretty wide data set that you're talking about in terms of the variety of malt. Yeah, yeah, we really wanted to yeah, have a broader data set than what had been done before and have a sense on whether it's Right, because we already know that in hops it can be very variety dependent and also probably year to year dependent. So we had no clue in malt, so we wanted a, a broad range. Yeah, and of course you're you're like you mentioned, you're you're looking at the bound thiols here, right? You're not measuring free thiols um in, in the malt. Yeah, because as I said, so there is no free tiles in malt that we know already. We tried to look for and we couldn't find any. Nice. Okay. Uh, but so then, but you did mention that there's like enzymatic processes and those malt and the malts might have those enzymes. So then that's sort of the second half of this, right? Is like, can those enzymes that are present in the malt the um, reduce these I don't know the exact term but like reduce this glutathione and break it down into those um, constituent pieces that would be useful for yeast um, during fermentation yeah exactly because um, from the study that had been done so far on yeast by example we know that usually yeast is more efficient on the 
shorter type of precursors like the C1 you talked, you mentioned, cysteine. Uh, but usually the major pool is under the G form. So if we could break down and, and provide a pool to the yeast that is more uh, under the C form would be greater. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. So, so the, you know, hops, um, like you said, in bound thiols is mostly that G form as well, right? And then when we look at grapes, and then potentially when we look at malt, we might expect to see a, a large pool of G form. But then the question is, can we get that um, actually into the form that yeast can use? Can we break down that G form and get it into the the form that that uh, yeast need in order to release the aromatic compounds? Yeah, yeah, that was definitely one of the questions before uh, before the study. And um, because we know malt has a bunch of enzymes, uh, pretty useful uh, during the mashing, of course, the amylases and stuff. Uh, but what about the enzymes that are required to break down the glutathione addicts? Yeah, and then there's a question too of like we, you know, we we, we can look at the malt um, as much as we want and see if there are enzyme additions in the malt too. But once we put it through the brewing process, right? <laughs> uh, there's a question of how much of that survives because I, I haven't asked you this question yet, but it's something I, I assume is the case. Thiols are volatile, right? Uh, which might mean if you release all the thiols too early, they volatilize off or, or you know, potentially don't make it and survive into the final beer. Yeah, that's a very good comment, uh, actually. Yeah, because you... Obviously, you don't want to, indeed, you don't want to transform all your bond tile pool under the free form too early. As you said, during boiling, they are way too volatile and also super uh, reactive to oxidation. So they probably, they, they won't make it, that's for sure. Yeah, they wouldn't make it. And so uh, again, uh, one thing that you wanted to look at in this is where in the pro is in the process are there uh, ways that we're reducing that pool and where? And the mash is a nice place to start. So you also looked at sort of um, some normal mashing temperatures and and assessed like how those precursors or those bound thiols might change during the mash. Yeah, exactly. We looked at the profile of these bound thiols and the different interconversion. Uh, like shrinking the glutathione, like the the tripeptide glutathione uh, chain into smaller uh, dipeptides and and amino acids and and yeah, that was the question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's right. Yeah, so so does the mash actually reduce? Um, the 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 pool and make it more usable uh, for the word and the beer? So okay, uh, yeah. sorry, I, I want to add something also. Yeah. Uh, one of the assumptions we also had was that at the end of the day, a beer that is not really heavily hopped, even though we we kind of knew we were going to find a certain amount of, of bond tiles in malt, uh, an unhopped beer is never characterized by uh, grapefruit or patient fruit aromas coming from those tiles. So we were kind of also looking for like a disappearance or like uh, we were suspecting that we would lose some of these bomb tires and possibly the free that would be released uh, during those process that the hot side of the brewing process so mashing yeah. And yeah. maybe so we might also lose some of these uh, thiol components that we want because, like you said, uh, you know, we might not uh, taste those in regular all malt beers. Well, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll see um, if there are thiols or bound thiols in malt, and whether those survive. Those uh, thiols will survive uh, at least the early parts of the brewing process. We'll be right back. More Beer's slogan is absolutely everything for homebrewing, and it's easy to see why, given their selection of over 8,000 products, like the Brewbuild X3 Uniconical Stainless Steel Fermenter, or the Cosmos series of kegerators that give you everything you need to get started with dispensing and serving your homebrew. For quality fermentations, More Beer carries a variety of yeast and nutrients from the likes of Imperial Yeast, White Labs, and Cellar Science. More Beer offers free shipping on most orders over $59, and they also have a killer YouTube channel featuring brewing tips, hijinks, and awesome gear giveaways. Check out everything More Beer has to offer at morebeer.com.
Thiols are incredibly potent aromatic compounds that contribute fruity and tropical characteristics to beer and are especially desirable in hoppy styles like IPA, pale ales, etc. But we've just learned that while malt doesn't ne- may not necessarily have a huge supply of bound thiols, the amount of malt used, right, the, the volume of malt that's in beer could generate a significant pool of potential thiols. And Cecile, you were commenting just before the break, um, it's this observation that I've had as well, you know, if there is this pool pool of potential thiols, how is it that we don't have strong thiol aromas in all of our all malt beers, even those made without hops? Yeah, so because those are also like entering, let's say, in the brewing process way earlier than hops. So they will go through mashing, boiling, and those are a very harsh step for volatile compounds. So uh, especially if we're already at the state of free thiols, they they for sure won't survive the boiling step. And and even in the, the, the bond form, we weren't too sure how those would would behave during the meshing. So that was the whole point of the study too, like uh, what's happening to those bond tiles during meshing and are they reacting with other stuff? Are they... Yeah, are they lost or not? Yeah, are they lost? And, and you know, that's a good point, right? Because we think about, like, enzymes and we think about beta lyase and thiolized yeast and all these types that are increasing um, the amount of enzyme activity that would help release those thiols. But that's a, enzymes are a part of it, but you also mentioned earlier chemical release, and that and that can be temperature, right? Temperature and, and also physical um, things uh, that are happening during a vigorous boil, right? That's a really high temperature, and there's a lot of movement and a lot of things that are, you know, bouncing off of each other and potentially breaking apart at molecular levels um you know so so you've got all of that as well and one thing i wanted to clarify too um you know is is that if the thiol remains in that bound form so from that glutathione all the way down through you know to the cysteine bound thiol it won't be um aromatically sensed right um if it stays in that form it doesn't actually we can't you know, smell it or taste it in the beer. It's the free thiol that we care about in the finished product. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. Like the the bond form are definitely odorless, so you need to release the the thiol moiety to have an actual aroma. Yeah, and and we have to start with some sort of bound pool, and then like you said, sort of either break that down into that cysteine. Um, you know, thiol uh, uh, moiety, I guess. I don't know exactly the word for it, but cysteine bound to a thiol that then the yeast or beta lyase can act on and release it um, uh, to, to release those thiols. So that breaking down is kind of an important process um, as we go, as we talk about and go through this in, in terms of our pool of bound thiols that we might be able to access. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, as already mentioned, the major form of the pool is usually under the G form, but that one is like, I mean, some yeast have shown ability to use it, but most of the yeast are better at working on on the cis type of adducts. So if we can work, uh, if we if we can break down the G adduct to cis adduct before yeast enter. In scene, in the scene, yeah, it would be would be a good idea. Yeah, it would be a good idea, and then maybe we could use some of those and create more uh, more thiol precursor or more thiols um, in the finished beer. Okay, so you just mentioned that at least in hops, um, the G um, G conjugate is uh, has a higher concentration. Um, that that's the the or the, that's the largest concentration, right? The glutathionylated uh, uh, bound forms are the highest. Uh, what did you find? Um, I guess in malt and Let's start with the pale malts. Um, what did you find about those concentrations for those brown uh, precursors uh, in malt? Yeah, so in the pale malts, uh, just like in hops, the G form was the the major form of of bond tiles, uh, and it the the it was had pretty wide range. Let's say it was ranging between twenty and and three hundred and twenty ppb of of uh, Glutathion uh, adduct of three SH. So, so two hundred to like three hundred and twenty parts per billion. I mean, if 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 we were able to achieve to achieve like a full reduction, you know, of that into the, a, a free thiol, uh, that would be a huge amount of thiols, right? I mean, we'd be definitely be able to to sense that. Now, I'm not suggesting that we'd be able to achieve a full reduction, but if we could, that's potentially a huge pool and source of of thiols. 
Oh yeah, but that would be too much at this point because <laughs> yeah, the the threshold is like more than one thousand times lower than that. So if we were to release all of it, it would be a thial bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It would be a file. It would be crazy, right? And that's also a little bit of what I wanted to get to there too. And so, even in hops, well, I guess I maybe should ask this question here: How does that um, range? So, from two twenty to like three hundred and twenty ppb in pale malts, how does that compare to uh, hops, for example? So, in hops, we were usually you usually find. From 100 to 1,000 times more than uh, that. So we are at PPM level uh, in hops in terms of bomb tile and the, the glutathione especially. So there is way more uh, bomb tiles in hops. But again, we use way less hops in beer too. Like the proportion would be like from i guess from 10 to 100 times less uh, of uh, hops <laughs> right, compared yeah. to malt something yeah like that. yeah of course right i mean i mean it's we think about like right, just like the bags of malts you're putting you know giant you know 50 kilo bags of of, of, of malt um or 40 kilo bags of malt into uh into beer versus you know um a, a few hundred grams uh, or maybe a kilo of of hops depending on your brew size right but you're talking yeah. like you're talking way lower um uh, amounts of hops that are that are getting in uh, but also hops have the cheat code and that hops have free thiols um as well which malt doesn't seem to have uh they just have those bound thiols and and so okay so that that g conjugate again ranging from you know 20 to 320 ppb uh, again, like the if you could access the thiols that are in those bound forms, that would be a thiol bomb. It would be huge. I mean, even accessing just a small amount of those, some of those that were at 320 ppb, would play a significant role um, um, in beer. And but we talked about that G form. It's got to go through several steps to get to that um, that that cysteine, uh, the, the C form that's work able to be worked on by yeast. So you also measured like sort of the interim steps, right? You measured the glutathione as, yeah, there was a huge pool of glutathione-related thiols, um, but there you also measured the C conjugates as well. So talk to us about how much of those C conjugates did you find um, in pale malts? Uh, we actually found like very few cis uh, adduct levels uh, of 3SH in malt. Uh, and interestingly, the, the deep, deep uptight form, the cis glee, uh, was in high, at higher concentration than the cis form, which, which is like opposite to grapes, by example, to go back to that comparison. Um, but so way less, but again, the, like if we compare to hops, like if we go back uh, to the hop comparison, I would say the proportion between cis and, and glue is pretty much the same in hops and in malt. The proportion. Um, yeah. You mean, okay, yeah. So the if you were to measure just like hops and then just measure malt, the proportion between the G conjugates and the C conjugates is roughly the same. They're still lower even in, in, in hops. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Interesting, and and so how do we how do we get at those bound um, enzymes? Work on those to to release those bound thiols in hops, right? Yes, that was the next step after looking at all the the content in all different malts. We wanted to to see if malt had the enzyme and the ability to break down this G a pool uh, down to a cis pool of thiols. Um, so that's what uh, that was. Sorry, that was the point of the second trial where we let the malt sit at different temperature that were like the classical machine temperature uh, to have those enzymatic activities uh, arise and see how this G adduct would change within time and would it become like a cis uh, adduct content. So yeah, so then what what did you find? So maybe let's uh, let's talk about what you did there and then uh, what you found um, at those mashing temps. Yeah, so we compared uh, room, uh, room temperature and then uh, forty five degrees Celsius, so which is one hundred thirteen Fahrenheit degree, uh, and then fifty five, which is one hundred thirty one uh, Fahrenheit. 
And at these two temperature, where those are were chosen because we know a lot of malt enzymes are active at those temperature. Uh, I'm not talking about amylases, of course, but more like the proteolytic enzymes are usually more uh, able to work at these two temperatures. And compare like by example to, first of all, even at room temperature, we did see a change of profile with time. Like if we were sit, letting sit the malt in water for 24 hours, all that G pool uh, gets transformed first to like cis glee and then eventually uh, to cis adduct. So malt does have the enzymes uh, to break down the G adduct into cis adduct. So that was already something cool to see. That's cool. Uh, so so malt actually has the enzyme, right? I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because malt has just an amazing package of enzymes um, to be able to do the job that it does. But it had that that enzyme to break down the G into that C addict form, right? The C that's just attached to the thiol that the yeast could could uh, could work on. That's pretty interesting, right? I mean, and that's kind of like I'm I'm sort of scratching my head here a little bit, going, yeah, but I don't ever get thiol bomb you know, Hellas, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, uh, and, and yeah, so even at room temperature, you see this, but what about at the other mashing levels? Because again, you mentioned we're also kind of looking for where's the loss happening because there has to be a loss at some place, right? Yeah, exactly. So at 45 and 55 degrees, those were uh, really good temperature to improve those enzymes activities. So because in room, at room temperature, it took... Uh, like eight hours to really uh, decrease the the glutathion adduct and transform it into the cis type, while in, at higher temperature, uh, those uh, reactions were occurring after one, two, and three hours already. Um, so that was the first thing. But then we also tried at 80 degrees, which is 176 Fahrenheit. And at this temperature, we were it's like usually the mash out uh, temperature where we're hoping to have destroyed all the enzymes of the mash, right? So we were wondering what we would see. And we did see a decrease of the glutathion adduct, but no increase of the cis adduct. So it, it was like this glutathion adduct was disappearing into something else, but the enzymes that is supposed to create the cis addict wasn't working anymore at this temperature. Ah, interesting. So it wasn't getting reduced at those higher temp. It wasn't getting into the form that it would need to um, for yeast to act on it at that higher temperature, at that ADC, um, 176 yeah. rate. Interesting. Okay, so so then what does that sort of so what does that tell us then? I guess that tells us that the malt has these enzymes that are capable of reducing the G addict into the constituents that we would need in order for yeast to act on it and release the thiols. But um, you know, the temperatures of the mash are playing a role. Yeah, de definitely. Depending on your mashing program. If you skip all this lower temperature, which is usually done, like except for 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 wheat beer, we we usually skip those lower uh, temperature. Like yeah. uh, we don't. I mean, it's not something really common anymore. But if we skip those lower uh, mashing temperature, you might won't let this malt enzyme break down the G addict, and then when you're you finish your your mashing at higher temperature, you will kill all these enzymes. So if you're stuck with this G adduct at a pool at this point, it's like too late. It's too late. And so maybe that starts to explain a little bit of where this loss is happening, right? Because like you said, a single infusion mash, a, a classic single infusion mash is like 65 Celsius or, you know, around 150 Fahrenheit. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, a, a single infusion, just that one, you know, injection of warm water, that's not, we're not, we might not see that um, reduction from the G addict. So then maybe the G addict is the only one that makes it into or further into um, the brewing process. And then again, yeast aren't, some yeast can, but most yeast aren't able to work on that G addict. Um, so you have this bound pool of thiols that then stays bound um, and stays non-aromatic. Yeah, that's right. And also, I mean, I don't want to do go into too much uh, chemical detail on that, but we also found that this G addict is able to react with some aldehyde that would be in the medium and that will become like a hidden form of the uh, of the, the glutathione adduct. Oh, wow. So 
yeah, that's also another way of losing this glutathione addict pool. Yeah, so it's it's the glutathione addict that's just reacting with something else and not getting reduced down into the system. So it's just disappearing, right? Parts of the pool disappearing. Uh, kind of. It, it's not really disappearing. It's more hidden because if you would play around with pH, you could go back to having this glutathione addict again. But yeah, no, it's definitely, I, I guess we could say it's kind of lost. Yeah, and and so I guess then the the big takeaway from this part of the research is that yeah, why you know even though there is a pool of uh, malt enzymes, you know the mashing process and what most people are doing to the mashing process isn't going to result in a huge conversion um, of those G adducts into the ad the cis adduct that's actionable by yeast, um, and at worse. At mash out, when you raise the temperature, you're going to neutralize all those enzymes too. Um, and then, of course, it gets boiled after that anyway. So, you know, further uh, neutralization of those of those enzymes. But ultimately, this means that if you're not forming those um, cis products during the mash, you're not going to have them in the finished beer. They're just going to stay bound. I mean... Depending on the yeast you use, again, like some yeasts are still able to to break down a little bit of those glutathione Um But yeah, uh, if you're really looking to optimize the release of thiols, getting stuck at the G form is definitely uh, not the best. Yeah, and the, well, and so something else just popped in my head, and I apologize to you because we didn't talk about this before the show, but I know that my co-host Jordan is going to want to know because he's probably in my ear right now screaming, you've got to ask her about mash hopping. Um, I was <laughs> thinking exactly the same, actually, so oh, it's well, good you mentioned okay, it. Okay, <laughs> good. So so how would mash hopping play a role here? Yeah, because at the, at the end of, of our study, we, we ended up saying, okay, um, maybe there is a way around, like, could we still be like, should we take advantage of these malt enzymes? And like we first like uh, mentioned that one idea could be like having like a malt treatment uh, on the hops before adding the hops, let's say, because hops also uh, the same way as malt has a lot of G adduct and way less of the cis adduct. So we could pre-treat the hop with this malt enzymes by example but yeah i guess this practice of now uh hop mashing is kind of in going into that direction i guess because uh, if the hops is added at those lower temperature of the mashing process where probably the malt enzymes are still able to to be active because yeah you mentioned 65 degrees i didn't uh, check at which temp temperature really like those enzymes stopped working but they're probably still a little bit active at that kind of temperature so we could indeed guess that those on the malt enzymes uh, could work on the the bomb tile pool of hops if it were to be added in the mesh. Yeah. And then potentially, so again, so you're just increasing the pool that those enzymes could work on. So you just add more in there and then potentially they release some. And it, it, it's an important point too, not to lose sight of that releasing even a small amount of that pool could potentially result in significant aromatic changes in the beer. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, as we, as we mentioned, the, the threshold of the free form is at uh, PP T level per, per, per trillion, while uh, the bond form are found at part per billion in malt and part per million in hops. So there is more than enough uh, bond tiles out there, uh, and only like less than one percent of credits would be already far than enough. Huh. Interesting. There was also one other key piece of this before we leave this uh, the the that part of the the research because I still want to talk about the specialty malts too. I don't want to forget that uh, those as well. There was one other key piece of this that you found that was really interesting too. And we talked about okay, we're going from the G adduct down to the cis adduct, and then yeast can act on that cis adduct. But you found something interesting um, in the malt uh, as well that there could be a possibility that there's also that beta lyase activity in malt liberating free thiols. Yeah, that was one of our hypotheses because if we look at the molar balance of, of all the, the bond content, so we we do see the, the reduction of the the G adduct turning into cis adduct eventually, but the cis adduct that was formed couldn't explain 
all the decrees of glutathione. So we were missing a, a part in the in the molar balance here. So we thought maybe those uh, cis adducts were also th releasing free because we didn't measure the free tires in our trials. It was like it wasn't a, an ideal medium to to measure free tires like uh, way too too many malt and it would probably go under oxidation too fast. So it wouldn't it didn't make sense to measure free tires in our trials, but. We were suspecting that maybe some part of this cis adduct did end up releasing some tires that would explain the loss in the molar balance. Yeah, right. I mean, this is kind of that, that like you know whatever Newton's second law of of um, of, of uh, thermodynamics, right? That that mass doesn't ever get. Uh, uh, destroyed, it just gets changed. And so, if we think about this from the three, the three peptide, right, the tripeptide glutathione, um, you would expect you should be able to track where those go, right, as they go and break off. It, but and and so, if they are reducing down to that cis, um, that just single cis and thiol moiety, then. Um, that's what you should expect to see. You should expect to see that glutathione reduced and the increase, an equal increase in that cis um, 3SH moiety, for example. But you didn't. There was actually not as much 3SH, cis 3SH produced, which might indicate that that even is getting broken down um, into something else and thus free thiol release from malt. Yeah, yeah, I guess you you explained it better than me, but yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's exactly right. So <laughs> the, yeah, we were missing a part in the molar balance, so we we were suspecting that yeah, indeed those cisadic may have also been uh, broken down and may have released free tires that we didn't measure here. No, that's that's all. That's all just me trying to synthesize and, and understand everything that, that that's working. So I, I think you explained it well, and I think uh, that makes a lot of sense. So then, that's pretty cool finding that malt could also, you know, have that activity that's that's liberating um, those those free thiols. So again, sort of to back up and talk about the conclusions of this part, at least of the study where we're talking about pale malts, is that pale malts definitely had bound forms of thiols at way lower concentrations than are in hops but still a sizable pool of bound thiols and they have the enzymes at least pale malts had the enzymes uh, that were active at those lower proteolytic temperatures like a protein rest for example to convert that bound G form of thiols into that cis form that might ultimately result in higher um, thiols in the finished beer so that's a pretty cool finding from this research right is you, you confirmed that there could be a potential source of thiols from pale malts yeah yeah and especially yeah the enzymatic part is something to look into that's for sure yeah something to look at in the future right like what temperatures yeah. are we really sensitive to and like where where can we can we do a thiol rest right <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah. instead of a protein rest I, I don't know if that's something uh that, that we could do but okay but then so uh, enzymes are temperature sensitive um and ph sensitive i've talked about that on the show before and that's something you've alluded to already a lot of specialty malts go through particularly um you know uh, temperatures uh, high temperatures and or uh changes in ph what specialty malts did you look at in the study and then let's talk about the results so we can talk about like what 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 uh, what you looked at in terms of I think you had 12, uh, 12 different um, specialty malts that that you looked at, but I'm I'm more interested in just kind of like classes of malts. I'm guessing that you're going to look at something like um, you know some lightly kilned malts, some heavily kilned malts, some roasted malts, some caramels um, in that in that sort of range. Yeah, exactly. We wanted to have a at least a range of of color in terms like a EBC degree. Uh, so we were ranging from three uh, EBC degree, which is like a Pilsen uh, malt, to like 1,500, so like a really uh, <laughs> Dark roasted, malt. Yeah, high, really highly roasted. roasted malt. Yeah. And everything that sits in between, like we had Munich malt uh, that was l lightly colored, and then some caramel malt too, and one acid malt too. So 
just to get a sense on how those hops, uh, what the bomb tile profile would like in these hops. In those malts. In yeah. these malts, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. So like, uh, that's interesting, an acid malt. Uh, that's a fun one. So like the, the pH, I guess, being a, a question there, right? Is Does the pH of the acid malt impact uh, these bound forms of thiols? Yeah, exactly. So this acid malt is usually used in Germany because, you know, of the... The Heidschebold. Right, yeah, of course. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so, since they can't add any acid, sometimes they, they, they use that kind of malt that has been like previously uh, acidified. But anyway, when we looked at those, that malt, he had a really different profile. Like, even though it wasn't colored like really much, so the, the his EBC degree in terms of color was still pretty low, he had really fewer. Uh, bomb tires and it led us back to to the formation of those bomb tires and and like the lux activity and everything and wondering if that ph has inhibit all the enzymes that uh, are required to form those bomb tires yeah. initially yeah, so so it, so it didn't like the acid malts had low levels of even the G um, addicts, which were high with the highest pool, right? It had low levels of those. Were you even able to detect the C conjugates in those in those malts, or do you recall? I don't recall. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> okay. that's okay. But in any event, it's way lower than what would be in the pale malts. Um, and, and so, uh, then I'm guessing too, as we increase uh, temperature and color uh, or roasted activity, then we're also going to reduce those uh, bound thiol forms, those G conjugates. Um. Yeah. I mean, we didn't see a, a linear relationship between the 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 kilning, like the temperature of, of kilning and the, the amount of precursors up to a certain point. Like if we screen a uh, degree BC from 5 to 50, it was going a little bit like randomly, like the amount of tire of bomb tires weren't following like a decrease, as you said. But then, yeah, that's for sure when we get to the the roasted one that had like a one that was at one th- 1500 degree BC. This one had no bomb tiles at all. Like everything had been destroyed, and <laughs> that's pretty logical, I would say. Like nothing surprising here. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, up to 50 uh, degree BC in terms of color. So uh, I don't know exactly what temperature would be in the killing process, but still much higher than what a pencil man would go under. Um, it seems like okay for bomb tiles like yeah 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 it, it seems like the the low temperature kilning or at least like for pale malts right in that sort of range um even i don't know 50 ebc uh feels like uh you know a decent amount of color i, I guess you know i don't know 40 ebcs is something like a brown malt or like a dark brown malt i guess is that is that right whenever we're talking mm. about that range um i mean yeah 51 is like biscuits so okay biscuit is 51 ebc that's good to know um so yeah so then biscuit malt is definitely going to have some color to it right um and that's gonna so even at biscuit there's still bound forms of thiols yeah exactly oh cool that's fun and and uh, did you do the same you know temp uh, temperature studies too of like mashing those at uh, you know at uh, uh 45 celsius and at 55 celsius and then also at 80 celsius we checked a few of them, um, like the Munich, by example. And so we did see an impact, like because these malts have been treated at higher temperature during the malting process, the, we were suspecting that the enzymes have maybe have been destroyed during the clinic process already. So when we try our mashing trials, we did see that a little bit in, in like Munich or, or other uh, I don't recall Abbey. I think the mold that had like higher that had been killed at higher temperature were showing lower enzymatic activity. That's for sure. And again, in the acid mold, we didn't see any enzymatic activity at all. Like no transformation of the few bond tires we were able to find. Nothing was changing 
Interesting. In solution. So. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and so I just did some quick Googling while you were um, uh, giving that answer. And so around 50 EBC is around like 20 SRM or 22 SRM. So uh, so that's a, some decent color on it, but not not uh, not huge. But that definitely like a dark Munich would fall into that. And like you said, a biscuit and an abbe, right? We're not talking about a roasted malt. So you mentioned that the roasted malts kind of obliterated everything, which makes sense. Um, you know, but it, it's interesting. So at around, even at, at, at you know, know low temperatures enough to create some of those kilning flavors you get still get um some potential thiol pools although it sounds like maybe lower than the pale malts right uh, i it, it catch kind of makes sense these enzymes are temperature sensitive the 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 uh glutathionylated thiols the bound thiols are temperature sensitive and so you know while it wasn't a linear um while it wasn't a linear uh, uh, relationship in that, you know, as kilning temperatures increase or as the amount of kilning increases or as the color increases up to that 50 range, there wasn't a linear relationship past that. Once you get past a certain point, yeah, you're you're reducing the enzyme activity and you're reducing the bound thiol form. Yeah, it's not, we don't even talk about reducing at this point. We're it's more just, like destroying everything. Yeah, you're just destroying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're just cooking it off. Yeah, um, and then so I uh, one final question about this reason research then. Um, so it sounds like there is potential uh, for thiols from malt to make it into the finished beer. But I'm wondering like how much of it is going to make it out into the finished beer. And I know that wasn't necessarily a, 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 a conclusion that you were able to draw from your research, but I'm kind of more interested in like your thoughts here. Um, are there potential, you know, um, cis versions of those thiols that we could use um, in in beers if we wanted to increase our thiol uh, uh, thiol concentration in beer um, could we make let me ask it a different way could we make a th- a, a grapefruit hellas or uh, um, a passion fruit hellas <laughs> I guess there is room to try I mean there is a little bit of different beliefs out there I would say. Uh, I'm more in the team of, yeah, like a unhopped beer will never end up being really like a ar- uh, tropical or fruity aroma from the tiles. But knowing what we know now, maybe we could, yeah, play around with the mashing temperature program and make sure we're not losing all precursors in the mesh too because that was something we worry about like once those precursors they react with some other molecule that and then could end up being lost in the mesh and making their way through boiling i mean there is still a lot of steps to survive (laughs) before making it to fermentation where finally yeast will be able to use it so i guess there is room there's room to improve. There is room. Room for study. But I, I'm still doubtful at this. Yeah, point. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's still got to. It's still got to make it through the boil, <laughs> right? And yeah. all of that other stuff that's that that's going to happen. But at least uh, there's some opportunity for future research, as there always is with scientific questions. But so, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? Uh, yeah, I was, but. For me, yeah, the, the very interesting point too was that malt does contain the enzymes that are able to break down uh, glutathione addict. So there is something there too to to look uh, at. Like as we mentioned, is it either a hop mashing? I don't know how you Mash call it. Hopping, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. or do like yeah, as I mentioned, a pre-treatment of hop with malt before adding the this mixture as a like a dry hopping thing. I, I mean. Who knows? Um, but yeah, the fact that malt does contain the enzymes that are effective, and like we showed that they were really effective at at degrading the glutathione addict was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So there is there is opportunity for future study. Uh, I love it. I, I think that's a good thing to for brewers to take away from this is maybe we could do some uh, treatments to increase the amount of thiol since malt has these enzymes. So, well, cool. Well, Cecile, thank you so much for doing this research looking into thiol uh, from malt. And also thank you again for joining me in the Brew Lab. And I know I'll have you back on the show in the future to talk about the work you're doing with Tom. 
All right. I guess that's an invite I didn't know about yet, but <laughs> thank you for the heads up. And yeah, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. L less of an invite and more of shackles. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, of course. Well, thank you, Cecile. I was happy to have you as a guest. Thank you, Kate. All right. Well, in the show notes, you'll find links to the links to the two papers that we discussed in this show. And of course, next week, Jordan and I will be back applying the science of this week's episode. See y'all then. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer. Macy's has all of your Grillmaster essentials for Father's Day. Stop by to get our hand-trimmed chicken breast and certified Angus beef patties that are ready to grill so Dad can have his favorite dinner. Make sure to browse our bakery to find the perfect no-work Father's Day treat with our decadent peanut butter bars or famous donuts. Right now, you can get boneless beef ribeye steaks for $12.99 per pound at Macy's. Shop these Father's Day essentials in-store or online at Macy's.com through June 18th. Macy's, happy shopping!